So how I'm going to uh, start out tonight is by reading from Luke 15, 11 through 24. Wow. Follow along. Luke 15, 11 through 24. This is the parable of the lost son. Then he said, A man had two sons. This is Jesus telling this story. A man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck the country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens, who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the paws on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here I am, dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened cow and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. So this is probably one of the most popular stories of the Bible. And probably one of the most popular is referenced like outside of church as well. Because it's just such a beautiful and powerful story about like a father's love, about a parent's love. And this parable is a great reminder of our own need to return to God. It reminds us that we've often left God the Father behind by sinning against him. But he's always waiting to welcome us home. The story is also representative of the history of God's chosen people. Throughout salvation history, God's people have repeatedly sinned against him, only to realize their sin and return to him. God never rejects us when we return to him. He's never like too far gone to turn around, or we're never too far gone to turn around and be received by God. And this is like the amazing truth that we understand when we enter into salvation history. God is like the father in the story of the prodigal son is what it's called. Basically the son who, who turned away, the, the son who's lost. And he's always welcome, or he's always ready to welcome us back and say things like, you know, quickly get the best robe, like put a nice ring on his finger, like get get the nice meat. Like let's have a celebration, let's have a feast. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. The story of salvation is our story, like each of our stories. Just as like our own personal family history 
is our story as well. So we should make like every effort we can to truly understand it. We need to understand everything that's been done for us so that we can fully appreciate where we are now. Our story begins with creation. Like we have probably heard this a million times, the story of Adam and Eve and Genesis. But it really is remarkable. And it's worth talking about over and over again because it's insane. God made mankind in his image and in his likeness. A phrase that we hear all the time without really like comprehending it, without really thinking about it. In biblical times, to say that you were made in someone's image and likeness was to say that, that you were their son or their daughter. I let that sink in for a moment. We were meant to be God's sons and daughters. We were meant to be the royal heirs to God's heavenly kingdom. We were destined to perfectly love him and be loved by him for all eternity. But then we know what happens pretty much immediately. Sin enters the world. And just like the prodigal son left his father, we too, through original sin, abandon our father. And we no longer deserve to call ourselves his children. But like a loving father, God desires to welcome us back into his family. He wants us to include us in a familial relationship with him. And that's like what we were created for, is that relationship. And so the rest of salvation history is the story of God trying to gather us back, trying to welcome us back, trying to invite us back and convince us to come home and to keep us members of his family, to remind us that we are members of his family. God began to gather his family together when uh, he called Abraham. And he called Abraham to leave his mother and his father and go to the land that he would show him. And Abraham did as God asked. So God promised to make all of his descendants numerous and abundant and to bless them. God blessed Abraham and his wife Sarah with a baby boy who they named Isaac, even though they were way too old to be having kids. And even today, we can trace our Christian heritage back to Abraham. It's like, you know, through Ancestry.com or whatever. But that's why we call him our, our father in faith. And Isaac then had a son named Jacob, who God renamed Israel, because he just loves to do that and make us remember twice the amount of names, right? And Israel had 12 sons who became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. Another reason why Hebrews are often referred to uh, as the Israelites in scripture. And Israel's 12 sons eventually moved to Egypt to avoid this famine that was going on, which led to the enslavement of the Israelites in Egypt. So that kind of backfired, but they didn't starve to death. So then God called Moses to set free the Israelites uh, from their bondage in Egypt and led them to the Promised Land. We are probably pretty familiar with the story of Moses parting at the Red Sea, all that good stuff for 40 years in the desert. God was delivering them from slavery, and yet they rebelled against him in like the middle of this whole thing. And they questioned him, and they were speaking out against him. But again, like the prodigal son, they wanted to do things on their own. And they wanted to just say, like, no, Dad, appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, just Give me all the things I need, and I'm going to get out of here. But God, in his goodness and in his love, gave them what they wanted. And when the Israelites eventually made it to the promised land, God helped them conquer their enemies, 
and settle on the land. And they were still afraid, though. And they still didn't trust God, even after all of this, even after all of the things that he literally, physically did for them, like handed to them. They were still afraid. And so, once again, they rebelled against him and they sinned against him. They even threatened to kill Moses and return to slavery in Egypt. What? They wandered in the desert for 40 years until God brought them back to the promised land. And even though the Lord was obviously on their side and delivered their enemies like right into their hands, the Israelites turned away from him again and again, worshiping false idols, forgetting all that he had done for them. And like the prodigal son, they were ungrateful for the many gifts that the Father had given them. And they became greedy, and they wanted more. But when they abandoned God, they found that their enemies had the upper hand. And once again, they found themselves enslaved and suffering. So they called out to God, finally, because they finally needed him again. And he delivered them with these mighty warriors and these like amazing wonders. Uh, there was General Sisera. Okay, cool. Nobody knows any different. We're going to go with Sisera. Thank you. Uh, who oppressed the Israelites. And he was slain by Jael. It's something like that. Bear with me on the Old Testament names. Uh, with a, <laughs> he slayed him with a tent peg, like a peg to set up a tent, uh, through the temple. And Sam, Samson harassed the enemies of the Israelites by tying torches to the tails of wild animals and setting them loose in their crops. That's just cruel. And he even defended himself against a thousand men with just the jawbone of a donkey. Like, these were just some crazy warriors that God sent to them. God sent then Gideon into battle against this insurmountable odds. And Gideon was victorious. Over and over again, God forgave the Israelites for their sins and welcomed them back into his family. The Israelites eventually demanded a king for their new kingdom. And God provided the most famous of these kings was David, uh, who you may remember as uh, the guy who killed Goliath and delivered victory to the Israelites, thus winning them favor and admiration. And the kingdom of David was overthrown shortly after David's death. Invaders conquered God's people and sent them into exile to be slaves in foreign lands. They just this just keeps, it's like a violent cycle. You think they learn. But God, again, didn't forget his people. God sent the prophets who reminded them of his faithfulness, and he proclaimed this coming of a savior who would restore the kingdom of Israel. But I just named just a whole bunch of people. What do they all have? God's heroes are ordinary people every single time. Like, it's amazing how he'll just pick like, the most basic people possible. And what's most remarkable about them is usually how unremarkable they are. We can see that even in the story of Jesus, how he's, you know, just born in a manger. Like, so unremarkable. So God's heroes are ordinary people whose only claim to fame, really, is that they trusted in and were faithful to God. That's like the only thing they really had going for them, every single one. Abraham was a nomad. Moses was a shepherd living in the wilderness. When God called Moses, he was, wasn't even attending his own flock. He was essentially like a hired hand. 
Jael was a woman, and women are not seen as equal to men at this time. Gideon was a doubter who demanded sign after sign from God before coming to finally believe him. David was just a teenager who just like happened to know how to use a rock with a sling. And he was so insignificant that when the prophet Samuel came to anoint one of Jesse's sons as the future king, not even Jesse thought it would be David. Not even his own dad believed that this was going to be the, the next king. The main characters in this story were not just nobodies. They were all great sinners as well. Abraham doubted God's promises. And he like cheated on his wife. And he was an adulterer. Moses was a murderer and an outlaw. In fact, when God called him, Moses had killed a man and was in hiding. David eventually became an adulterer and a murderer too. Like these are not perfect people. God always chose the unexpected and imperfect people to do his work. In Jesus, however, we have someone unexpected, but who is perfect. God sent his own son, who had been with him since the beginning of time, who had witnessed the many times that God's people had turned their backs on him. And as St. John the Evangelist wrote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. I'm sorry, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the beginning of the, the book of John in the Bible, the Gospel of John. The Word is Jesus. Spoiler, it's a capital W all throughout. And so God became man. He became man to save us and deliver us from like our own bondage. And not just like a physical bondage and slavery, like he did that over and over again. But he came to also free us from something much more sinister and deadly, which is our bondage to sin and death. Get it sinister and deadly and uh, yep, I'm very clever. He came to establish a kingdom, but not just like a, a physical kingdom or a political kingdom. He came to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth and make us all citizens of that kingdom. Invite us all in. It's like how uh, Alaska like really wants people to move there, so they'll they'll pay you to move there. I don't know if they still do that, but they did at the time the Simpsons movie was made. So that's how I feel about that. Jesus was not what anybody expected. He grew up in a small, dull town called Nazareth, and when Philip told uh, his brother Nathaniel that he found the promised Messiah, a Messiah from Nazareth, he responded, uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That is so sassy. That's like a straight up quote from the Bible. But can anything good come out of Nazareth? Tone it down, Nathaniel. Even when we look back on the incarnation today, we feel like Jesus should have been someone like, like powerful and authoritative. But instead he came as someone meek and humble. As St. Paul wrote, Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Which, by the way, if you're unfamiliar, is like 
one of the most painful and like shameful deaths that was offered at the time. So in this humility, in truly everything, Jesus is our model of holiness. Surprise, surprise, right? He shows us how to live and how to love by his incarnation, his birth and his death. He made it possible for us to like, once again enter into God's family and to be God's adopted sons and daughters through our baptism. He is the culmination of God's century-old plan and work. And we get the opportunity to know, appreciate, and love this gift. Or to forget about it and disregard it. Disregard the sacrifice of the one true God. And that's up to us. That's our choice. So make your choice. Amen.